Rainy greetings to the Audible Weed Walk episode 23. This is Nina. We are having another rain episode. This one is nameless. The previous two were cyclones and were formally given names. Nivar, that skirted us close, but did not impact us like, you know, we all thought it could. And Burevi, another rather slow-moving cyclone that made a landfall first in Sri Lanka, then it again went further sa- and made a landfall within India, but really poured most of its rain, at least it felt like, over us here. We barely had a few days of gap, and bam, another system. Rain is good, but what it does to the road, oh my god. It is currently like a moonscape. The precarious edges of the potholes that you want to navigate and often populate they often are populated by you know numerous cattle and goats you know this having a moment of reflection they are just standing there you know in some meditative trance not interested to move anywhere there is one particular one in uh, in the herd that roams between me and the road there is a cow uh, with not so little calf, so I do not know why she is so protective, takes a particular disliking of my bike. No, not at any other, not any time that I have passed, um, trying to balance myself through the slush uh, with the mask and the rain hood, and I peek out for this cow. Even if she sits, if even if she is sitting, this madam hurries back on her feet and tries to chase me. Well, now that I'm here, let's do some weedy wild green talks. Again, it's time to remind that because it's raining, one needs to be very discerning about what green um, to eat and how. Do not, um, it, it, it really um, are basically um, some of the things that I have already covered in the previous podcast. If it's something that is growing in the soil, you know, leafy greens that is growing in the soil and not hydroponically grown or something, then do not cook, do not eat it uncooked or at least blanched for at least until you have got 10 to 15 dry days. After that, pick the young ones. You know, there is a reason why the sprouts are considered more nutritious because it it you know, when the plant grows, it puts all its nutrition, all its uh, wonderful goodies in its new growth and which hasn't yet uh, got hold of all the toxins. So when the new sprouts come, you are actually absolutely fine picking them. Sometimes you can even get away with um, eating them raw and putting them in smoothies, some of them, not all of them, and um, until they, you know, become matured. But you, we are entering the season ab- of lush green. So hold on a bit, a few more days, 10 to 15 days. And if you are really somebody who take notice of this um, traditional foragers and what the fare they bring to sell in um, at the edges of the market, you would have noticed that since Kardigai Deepam, they haven't really got too many greens to sell. That's because their clientels are the traditional eaters. The traditional eaters are not the ones who are, you know, um, going to the supermarkets where almost everything is available around the year. So this traditional um, buyers would only pick what is what you're supposed to eat seasonally. So naturally, these ladies and um, not always ladies, uh, people who bring this uh, fair to the market only gets what they are they're going to sell and also um, p- perhaps they themselves forage only when it is supposed to be eaten so it's a good indicator of what you're supposed to when you're supposed to eat or not the things uh, you know a good thumb rule is that if it if it's something that is growing around you um, if the plant is growing on the soil and it's taller, it's tall enough that it is in your eye level and higher, you can pick those greens and, you know, um, fruits or whatever. 
Um, of course, Colocasia or RB leaves and roots are both edible at this season also unless they are growing in tele- terribly polluted water. Once again, some more, do- some more details of this I have already covered in the previous podcast. So you can refer to them. You know, I have been reading a lot about eating and foraging wild greens, their nutritional values and how amazing they are, not just in address- addressing malnutrition, but also addressing micronutrient deficiency. Micronutrient is one thing, but apparently um, their deficiency um, is a universal problem affecting some 2 billion people worldwide. 2 billion, imagine, a third of the entire human beings. This deficiency result in poor health, stamina, lower productivity, morbidity. This is the word we are very familiar with it now, right? We have been hearing comorbidity a lot. Um, high rates of mortality, increased rates of chronic diseases, permanent impairment of cognitive abilities in infants because micronutrient deficiencies of the mother. Compared to conventional cultivated um, species, wild vegetables are hardy, requires less care and are a rich source of these micronutrients. Did you know Amaranthus family? And there are a whole lot of them in my book from Arakirei, Sirukirei, um, which are the altern- um, Amaranthas, to all the Altanentheras or the Purnangani family. Uh, the Coxcomb or the Celosia has the micronutrients, say, uh, that are more bioavailable. You know, bioavailable means you can have a lot of micro- micronutrients, but it is such that if we eat them, they are not necessarily uh, something that we can, our body can assimilate. It just passes through the body. The bioavailable ones are the ones the body can take. So these um, amaranthus have bioavailable iron than most supplements that you can think of, including even spirulina. Isn't that wow? I was really amazed with this information. They grow on their own wherever they can. A variety called kupaikiri. Um, it actually means that, it, that one that grows in the dump. It is converting our dumps to the sources of health and nutrition and micronutrients. Power to all the wild greens. It is inspiring, isn't it? Gift is something one has to learn, not only to give, but also to receive. We clearly need to realign ourselves to our tradition being a av- tradition which is being aware of what is growing around in different seasons, knowing how to use the wild weedy greens that are here and now and re-establishing our relation with the nature. Wild greens, therefore, could make an important contribution to combating micronutrient malnutrition as well as providing food security. Their promotion and integration into human diets could assist in their protracted use and consequent conservation. However, the chemical, nu- chemical, nutritional and toxicological properties of especially local wild vegetables, the bioavailability of macronutrients present in these and their modification by various processes and techniques are still something that needs to be established and documented. Uh, like, you know, we gave the example of the iron. So before we can go full throttle, you know, a lot of research needs to be done. So, it is established, however, that from whatever we know, that uncultivated wild greens, we in our imprecise communication call weeds, are the ultimate opportunistic sustainable plant. But then, How early do we start not just eating them, but picking them? I mean, I don't mean how early um, or young the plant is. How young should the person be in, um, um, in order to forage? I've been pondering on that since I am planning a training program for our children, the change makers of the future. We are their teachers, educators and parents to bring about this value-based shift. It seems we can aim to reach out to children who are, you know, between 11 to 14 years old, a little older, I would say. 
they have environmental education that in as a curric- as a topic in their uh, sub in their schools that can be used to impart such knowledge from grade 6 to grade 8 they have been told after 8 they have no time for anything but board exams sad but that's the reality but i have been reading tales and memories of people who said they used to gather edible wild greens as kids while returning from school depending on their family for some this meant dinner or lunch this was common all across the subcontinent and i'm sure it exists somewhere in some remote areas still um for most part we have lost it where the children who gather uh, gathered food uh on their way back home were also around 11 to 14 years old or older i wondered but i have been seeing in my travels and through my work Uh, in rem- in remote areas that much younger kids accompany foraging efforts some ta- for sometimes as part of their games they gather up and pick especially yummy fruits which uh, with, with which typically has very big pits which adults are not interested at all but kids love them we have several in this area like that a wild variety of zizifus or bear um and wild busy wild really um, um um bushy uh dates which which is red initially and uh, when it becomes ripe it becomes a uh, completely dark in color but it's very sweet we have also the ripe yellow wild passion fruits that is in my book uh, but usually uh, that is eaten in this area by the kids and there are many others which are favorite of children Actually over the years i have noticed that fewer children forage them even in this area then um you know a few days back um i saw a photo this photo was shared by a farmer from beyond our borders with his 4 year old son holding a lush bouquet of wild greens that he has picked up on his way that will be cooked for lunch Research have shown that even in countries and cultures where kids f- um, food preferences are synonymous to anti-green that is when but when kids themselves are involved in growing them or picking them they are more likely to eat them so i didn't even ask uh, this uh, particular farmer if his child is going to eat and love eating the food cooked from that green of course he will he is just 4 set me thinking i found an article on environmental education itself this one is from romania that resonated with me it says in order to bring out its full potential environmental education has to be considered not as a separate discipline but integrated and run throughout other disciplines and everyday life it is so true it is not like you know you have a environmental education period and only there you study about that and le- rest of the time you are environmentless uh, that doesn't happen we want to integrate it with history with art with drama with growing food with everything a better and ideally um, direct communication of environmental knowledge between the scientific community and educational practitioner is the key importance in preventing misinformation and development of misconceptions it's also true and the third point is the environmental knowledge contributes to the formation of sound ecological thinking and moral judgment hopefully also leading to change in behavior and formation of environmentally committed communities This made me search for communities and culture where children still forage and forage young. It is something is it something that entirely economy depend, dependent or dependent on the parents who wants their children to grow up knowing these things? Is it a lack of parental care where the children are basically growing up on their own um are alone part of the day for whatever reason? And how does it affect the children themselves well this is not my area i am clearly delving into the realm of child psychology and development l- research but for me foraging can have the same effect as forest bathing if one is a forager 
and not an outsourced forager. Outsourced forager um, is a totally unsustainable practice and not only uh, it depletes the resources in the wild, it also makes the tribal and the poor people who normally collects and eats them opt for cheaper and processed food as their collection, which is, you know, they have foraged, becomes commercial. So for most part, they do not reap the benefit of um, the monetary benefit of it either. There might be exceptions, but the norm is um, that it's not a very great process. However, if one is foraging themselves or, you know, going along with um, the tribal people or the local people in a foraging trip, all those um, or, you know, foraging around your house, um, take a walk in the park, look around, pay attention to your surroundings or don't even pay attention, just be in the moment. It has multiple associated benefits. Effects of forest bathing is one. Sh Shinrin Yoku or the forest bathing is a Japanese tradition now becoming popular elsewhere too. Whether you call it a fitness trend or a mindfulness practice or it is a, actually a bit of both. But what exactly is it? It's the term that emerged in Japan in around 1980s as a physiological and psychological exercise called Shinrin Yoku, which literally means forest bathing. The purpose was twofold, to distress and, um, and rejuvenate. And the other one is to reconnect um, with nature. And perhaps uh, and one of the ancillary benefit is that once reconnected, the people will be more active in their conservation. Hold that thought. Next week, we will continue to ponder more on the topic of foraging by children. Stay well and stay safe. Oui, vous écoutez Auroville Radio from Auroville, la ville internationale in India.